Hi everybody, this is Dr. K from Holistic Minds. Today I'm really proud and happy to be introducing Dr. April Sperling. I, I, I heard of her genius work actually through Dr. Magoon in, in talking with you and in, in just having you share with me the work that you do. And as an osteopath, understanding some of the things you're doing, I, I realized that we had to talk and you had to come and share with our audience uh, just the, the miracles that you're working and, and the great work that you're doing. Because I, I think most of the world doesn't know that people like you exist and uh, they need to. They need to because, I mean, my God, like, mm -hmm. what, what is more important than sight? Right. Right? Yeah. So, I, I mean, you, you're not the run-of-the-mill optometrist by any means. So, c can you share with our audience a little bit about yourself and sure. th just the incredible work you're doing? All right. Well, um, I graduated from Western University in Pomona. Uh, and then I had the the good fortune to do a fellowship with Dr. William Padula in Guilford, Connecticut at the Padula Institute of Vision Rehabilitation. And it's really what I learned there that totally changed my practice. Wow. Yeah. And so what I learned was that although vision is a set of skills, the whole idea of visual spatial processing is so overlooked and in, in traditional practice. And that there is a way to change how you perceive the space around you with a non-invasive tool like a prism mm -hmm. that can be ground into a pair of glasses. Mm -hmm. And you can improve balance, posture, and gait. You can reduce headaches and light sensitivity. You can uh, change double vision you can have a tremendous impact on the quality of life of another person just by addressing their spatial processing, their visual spatial processing. Well, you make it sound so easy, you know? It's just like, <laughs> oh, well, you just do this. and But I, I think people need to really understand this. So, uh, I, and this is part of why I think it's so important that, that we have you sharing your information. Because most of the time we think of, we, we look straight, right? Mm -hmm. And whether someone's coming to a pediatrician or go, they're going to the ophthalmologist, we just look to see how well you can see straight. So we do a little chart, you know, mm -hmm. can you see the letters? And if you can see the letters, we say, look, oh, 2020 vision, you're, you're good to go. Right, and so that that's an excellent point, and that's part of why uh, people don't know that there's another part of vision processing, right? So the most common vision assessment is acuity, mm -hmm. but it's only one measure. It's an important one, but it's only one. And so often children who have visual processing problems or may have difficulty with tracking or accommodation or convergence, and it's really impacting their ability to learn, it's impacting their spatial awareness, their ball play, um, maybe they bump into their siblings or parents, they can't you know, say in a straight line, mm -hmm. they're, they don't realize that just because that, that child may have 20-20 acuity, that there are these other issues going on and that measurements can be made and action can be taken to improve that so the child doesn't have to have that experience. That's incredible. That's yeah. incredible. Mm -hmm. So can you help us understand what you mean by visual processing? Because I, I think that that's a term that's pretty foreign to most people. Sure. So. You have your concept of center, like your physical center of your body. Well, there's a visual overlay to that. And sometimes that visual overlay does mm -hmm. not match up to the physical center of the body. So there is a visual spatial mismatch that's occurring. And that is what we're manipulating with the use of the oak prism, is we're moving that mismatch into a match. And with that, you know, change can be made. That's so cool. 
It is. It's, it's really so cool. very exciting. It, maybe a way for people to contextualize what, what you're talking about is like I, I've had kids in the clinic mm -hmm. and I, I just watch them. So we do an hour long interview just for me to do my intake. And during that time, we've got toys they're playing with and they're you know running around doing stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, there have been more than a few times that I'll see the child like constantly just bumping into things. And I'm like, are they always this? Uh, clumsy? Yeah. And then that, that's the word the parents use. Oh, yeah. The, he's always been so clumsy. And I'm like, so how often does he bump it? Oh, he bumps into things all the time. Okay. All the time. Uh -huh. And then I'm like, well, have you had his eyes checked? And they're like, yeah, we went to the ophthalmologist and he has perfect vision. Yes. So uh, this is what visual processing is, right? And th this is what you're talking about, where the world is almost off dimension. Right. Is that is that a way yeah. to look at it? I, like yeah. it, the, the depth perception is off. So or sometimes depth perception can be off, and sometimes it's not off. But then again, you it's a measure, right? Okay. It's simply a measure, and then we're looking at a lot of other factors also. But yes, that that visual spatial processing, that awareness of their body in space is often overlooked in a traditional optometric or ophthalmological environment. Yeah, so th these poor kids are just lost in space, in they a way. They are lost in space. They're in lost way. in, not, not outer space, but in this space. In inner space. <laughs> in inner space, they're lost. <laughs> Yeah. And uh, I mean, I can only imagine if every moment of your day you literally did not know where your body was in space mm -hmm. and you're constantly bumping into things, that, that would create some degree of anxiety. Yeah, like, what would the experience be for, I mean, if. So you can have an increase in anxiety. You can be bothered by busy, visually crowded environments like Walmart or Target, the grocery store. So often those kids will be very bothered by the lighting, the fluorescent lightings in the store, the items on the shelves, there's just so much. And if they don't know where they are in space, it's like everything's a problem. And it may even, you know, wash over into their academics mm. and they may struggle with learning as well. And so it really becomes essential that we find out what is going wrong and how we can take steps to encourage those visual pathways and that communication in the brain and the body to work more cohesively. Great, yeah. great. But let, let's go back because I think that just this entire thing is, is something that, that'll probably blow the minds of some parents because they probably have these kids. And so th this population that Holistic Minds is, is really going to help are the kids that are just lost in a certain way. Mm -hmm. You know, some of them are going full-blown psychotic because they're just losing it. Some kids are just struggling on a daily basis and academics and all of these other factors come in. So it, it, these children basically have the lack of ability to take in their environment because everything is just kind of jumbled in a way, mm -hmm. right? Visually. Visually. Is, is that a good way to, well, to like... Well, it's not a jumble because it, it, they can see clearly, but what they can't do is figure out where they are in relationship to their environment. So it's not a lack of clarity, so it's not a blur, but it's this lack of perception or awareness because of that mismatch they cannot rely on the information that comes in their eyes to be accurate. They can see it, but they can't trust it. And so they often develop other coping mechanisms. So they become very tactile because they're just gonna touch everything and see huh. if they can make sense of it that way. So you have those that are uh, more sensory seeking because they can't trust what's coming in their wow. eyes. They're not sure where their sibling or their mom is and where they are in relationships. So they're constantly touch, 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 touch as they're trying to figure out where they are and how and what information that is coming in might be accurate wow. and what is not. Wow. Wow. I, I have to say that probably 30, if not 40% of the kids in this population have some kind of sensory processing disorder. Right. And it, this isn't to say that the visual system is the only sensory issue at play, but because visu vision is the primary sense, mm -hmm. it's our dominant sense, mm -hmm. when vision isn't functioning efficiently or well, then it 
makes all the other senses a bit harder. It, it's like there's a mismatch throughout. Wow, wow. So when we stabilize the visual system, then the other treatments that those children may be having, like OT, PT, speech, when it, they can become even more successful. They click in. They yeah. click in because if you stabilize that visual system, then the child it becomes more available hmm. for the resources that are being presented. So it makes a tremendous difference. Stabilize the visual system and then go. That's And brilliant. then move. And you'll get much, um, it'll yield much greater results. Yeah. It, you know, th this is part of what really holistic is, is about. Mm -hmm. It's about understanding how to prioritize the right treatments, mm -hmm. the right tools, because like in, in kind of context of what you're talking about, what I also see in another subset of the kids with sensory issues, they have super, super low tone. Mm -hmm. And these are the kids that for the life of them can't do any kind of physical therapy because they're just so weak and tired all the time. Mm -hmm. And you try to put a child like that through two, three times a week of therapy. Therapy, it, it is just a miserable time each and every time. Okay. So I appreciate you seeing this because if, if you can't process your environment mm -hmm. and then the, the OT is trying to put you through all of these different exercises, there, there will be, I'm sure, a high degree of resistance, mm -hmm. right? There, there will be a miserable experience mm -hmm. for the child and ultimately it won't be as efficient or effective as possible right. because these children are just compensating. They're compensating, they're compensating, they're compensating. They're compensating. Yeah. So I would agree with that. How else would parents know that their child may have a visual disturbance or, or mismatch? Uh, what are other signs? So um, they may be a toe walker. So we see that a lot on the autism spectrum. Mm -hmm. You'll see children come up on their toes. And that is, so there's a musculoskeletal piece to that. There is also a very significant visual piece. And so they have a, big enough mismatch in their spatial process that they are coming up on their toes to make themselves parallel, no, not parallel, perpendicular, <laughs> perpendicular to the floor. Mm -hmm. But the perpendicular isn't with their feet flat. That perpendicular is with their toes, with their heels up. <laughs> so they're perceiving the ground as sloping down and away from them and they are trying to keep from falling. No kidding. Mm -hmm. So what happens over time is that you do shorten the tendon, the Achilles tendon, mm -hmm. and, and you develop musculoskeletal changes that then really need the support of PT and other wow. therapies to help that body be in a different way. Hmm. So you have to address the visual piece, and then you do the physical therapy, and then you'll have more long-lasting results. Wow. That's nuts. That's it crazy. Is. So basically, they're standing on their toes to feel normal because mm -hmm. that is what makes them feel normal. So right. what looks strange to us for that child is actually... That's the mechanism that they found to figure out where they were, right? Wow. So that was the tool that they chose. Wow. So it, it may not be right or wrong, but it's the method that they figured out because, you know, the brain was really amazing and we don't like to feel insecure in our environment. So if we can figure out a way to maximize our comfort, we really try yeah. to do that. And so for these children, they come up on their toes because that is what makes them more comfortable in their environment. They feel more secure. But it's because they have a visual spatial mismatch that they've even had to come up with that strategy to begin with. Wow, wow. So that's one way. You have very heavy like heel strikers. You know, so with your toe walkers, they're mm -hmm. like your ninjas, mm -hmm. and they'll mm -hmm. sneak up on a parent. And then you have the the heavy heel strikers, where you know exactly where that kid is all the time, and you hear them long before they arrive. And so they also have a visual spatial mismatch. How, how does the uh, the heel strikers? Uh, like what what are they doing to to allow them? So they're um, pushing way back on their heels in order to feel like they are perpendicular to their world, but they're pushing back. back. And your toe walkers, like they're coming forward, forward and up on the toes. Wow. And then there are lateral uh, mismatches as well, but huh. they're harder to see. 
Well, like from a parent's perspective. Gotcha. Got you. Yeah. Looking from the eyes of the parent at the child, so th there's the possibility of toe walking, heel striking, the clumsy child mm -hmm. bumping into mm -hmm. things. Uh, if, in terms of just day-to-day -day life, what are other things that could show up that would be clues that? Uh... Um, so maybe they avoid reading. Maybe they avoid ball play. Maybe there are certain situations where they just pull back mm. because they, they feel insecure in them. So, you you know, children are so good at letting us know where the problem is. We may not know the solution, mm -hmm. but they do try to let us know. So if they're having problems in school academically and, and if it's a visual issue, then you may see them um, lose their place on the line, mm -hmm. uh, report that things move around on the line or the page. Mm. They may notice that things get blurry if they try to read. Interesting. Um, they may notice that when they they can read, but then they can't comprehend it because all of the energy and all of their resources are going towards just moving their eyes from word to word and line to line. So not only does it slow them down, so they're very slow readers, but then they don't retain the information. Because reading is a struggle for them. Because reading is a struggle and all of their energy is going into the act of reading instead of gaining the information from reading. Wow. So that's where we see it more academically. And then they may be clumsy and drop things. Hmm. Um, we had, a, we had a, a set of twins that mm -hmm. were with us for a while. And the mom's comment was, I redid my floor several years too early because she had installed hardwood floor uh -huh. and every night when the twins were taking their plate to the kitchen sink they always dropped their silverware and would drop their plate so they were scarring the huh. floors and it was very consistent i mean you could you know set your watch by it wow. and they would be dropping things well, why do you think that was happening because of the visual disturbance they had well, so again with the mismatch, they don't know where they are, they don't know where mm, things, things are. are. So and so the... then there's that clumsiness, this inherent clumsiness, because they just can't be sure and they also cannot trust their eyes. So they're wow. getting information, but they don't trust it because it's not really accurate for them. And so they're recognizing that, but they're not able to fully compensate. Wow. So they can have fine motor, gross motor they issues motor, gross that are all that are visual. Related. Wow, mm -hmm. that's crazy. Yeah. That's crazy. It's just the, it's that vision is that primary sense. And so it's directing a lot of the activities in our body and in our lifestyle. So mm -hmm. when it's a miss, then you see it trickle down through everything that the child is involved in. Every part of their being. Mm -hmm. You know, it's interesting that you talked about the reading because mm -hmm. one of the things that I've been smart enough to do is in, in my intake form, I actually have one, two specific questions. One is, does your child have difficulty with reading? And then the other, well, three, uh, does your child have any uh, problems tr uh, following the line mm -hmm. and do they ever reverse? Yes. So these are all little things that I built into the questionnaire so that every time we're checking on that. Yeah, those are excellent questions. And they're good for parents to ask their children if they don't know the answer to that. Okay. But to ask them how how it goes for them. Yeah, if they see double, are they blurred? Um, are they bothered by um, electronic devices? Mm -hmm. So there's always a flicker rate huh. on computer monitors, uh -huh, uh -huh. on your phone, on your iPad. Yeah. And that flicker rate, that flicker, can be very disturbing for someone with a visual problem. Oh, interesting. Mm -hmm. I hadn't and heard about that. And it can increase headaches if you're susceptible, right? Gotcha. So if you're having a problem, you can have headaches, you can just have a lot of visual discomfort. The That background light can create you know, a light sensitivity for mm -hmm. you. So there's so much that can be impacted mm -hmm. when there's a, a visual issue. Gotcha, wow. 
how I've, I've seen this and I, I, I'm sure you've seen hundreds of these cases. So back in the days when I first was really learning about this field of developmental optometry and is that is that basically the right term to call it or what would you so call are, your domain? So I do something that's called neuro-optometric rehabilitation. Okay. And um, absolutely, so if you are trying to help a parent to find access to care and possibly in their area, they can certainly look up developmental or behavioral optometry. They can look up neuro-optometric rehabilitation. Okay. And hopefully you'll find a provider within one of those and they will look to see what is inefficient for you. Not all of them at this time, and I hope that that changes, but not all of them at this time are fully utilizing yoked prisms to reconnect those pathways that have become disconnected. Hmm. But finding a doctor that is more functionally oriented is a step in the right direction. It's a good step. It's a good step. And so you can do that through um, the College of Optometrists and Vision Development. They okay. have a website where you can put in your zip code and see if there is a practitioner near you. Or you can go to the Neuro-Optometric Rehabilitation Association okay. website. And again, they have that same, you know, find a doctor feature where you Got put it. in your zip code. Got it. And, and we'll, we'll have uh, links to yours mm -hmm. and then all of these uh, in our references. So people would just be able to click and Certainly. go to the right place. Yeah. Now, uh, I, I want to break this down into two different parts. So let's start off with when it comes to reading issues, because I've had patients of mine that you know were delayed, and for me it's a big red flag when they're excelling in one area and failing when it mm -hmm. comes to reading or whatever. So I, I've seen scenarios where they go get their eyes treated, mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden they're jumping like two or three grade levels. What has been your experience with these children? Right, so if there are no other factors and it's just a visual issue, then they do tend to take off academically. So when you're able to address the problems that are occurring with them, then they become so available for learning mm. and their true potential then is maximized. So it is always exciting to have a child come in that hates reading and then after you've worked with the glasses and maybe they've done vision therapy, then all of a sudden they're at the top of their class and wow. it's always a warm wow. and fuzzy That's moment amazing. for everybody. We got a little note from one of our patients who um, had said thank you so much um, because I love reading now and Aww. I think she was, you know, she was little but oh, it was just so, so cute. Special. It was. And, and she was, you know, a bright young lady. And I think that, that this is occurring more often than not. You have these intelligent children, and you know they're, they're in there. But reaching their potential seems to be elusive. Yep. And then as a parent, you're struggling to figure out what piece of the puzzle is needed for that child. So if there's an academic issue, it's always a good idea to start with the eyes because that is what's between the book and the brain. Mm -hmm. And so if, the, again, it's just a visual issue, then you come in and you address with lenses and vision therapy and away you go. And that child is much more available to their potential. That's incredible. It is. You're, you're working miracles for some of these families. Well, in, you know, we don't do anything. We simply provide the tools and the child is able to take it from there. So well it really is about them and just providing the opportunity that they need to be successful. Yeah. You're allowing them to function at their optimal level. Yes. Yes. Yeah. It puts that into place for yeah. them, yeah. which is always exciting to see. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. T tell me about these prisms, how, how, the glasses that you create for these children. How, how do they work? W what is this magic that you're doing? Okay, so with the yoked prism, it means that um, the angle of that prism is the same in both eyes. So it's okay. set at you know 100 degrees, or maybe it's set at 220 degrees, or whatever it is. You have 360 degrees mm -hmm. to choose from, mm -hmm. right? 
And so what I do is I have the child walk if they can. They do not have to walk. If they're in a wheelchair or they need to use a cane, they absolutely can. But if they can walk, that is the easiest. They walk um, you know, the length of my office or mm -hmm. down into the dispensing area, and they turn around, they come back, and as they move through space, I'm able to see where they think space is. Huh. And then I create a match with lenses. So I put the lenses on them, they walk again, and then we're looking for changes in balance, posture, and gait because it impacts the movement and it impacts the movement immediately. Wow. Yeah. Mm. So we're getting in to where vision and motor meet. Hmm. So that is it typically at the level of the midbrain. And so the lenses create a visual spatial match, mm -hmm. motor changes, <laughs> just like that. <laughs> so I always tell my parents, they don't have to wait. Wow. You can see the motor change just wow. right now. That's incredible. Mm -hmm. So you're basically tweaking vision up, down. Left, right. So you're basically allowing how they're able to see to be in the same plane? Is that the right way of putting it? Well, let's assume, let, let's take our friend the toe walker. So if we have a little one on their toes, mm -hmm. um, I want to help them to be more comfortable putting their heels down. Mm -hmm. So I don't want them to continue to come up, so I don't want to match it exactly. I want to offer them a balance okay. where they can then bring their heels closer to the floor and they don't feel like they're going to fall. Mm. So it helps to change like their concept of ego center. Gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha. Because the, the toe walker, I'm guessing, is, is looking slightly up or, they often or are looking down. down. Okay. And they're coming up on toes. Gotcha. Yeah. So you basically help them with their eyes. Yeah, kinda. help them to come up. That's so, so you cool. may see, you know, other children who have difficulty making eye contact. Mm -hmm. Eye contact is a is a big flag that there's a visual issue, and it's mm. often not an acuity issue. It's a visual spatial processing issue. Wow. So when you help to make that visual spatial match for them, they are then able to look at you in the eyes, mm -hmm. right? Um, and much more so than they can when everything just seems more fragmented. Wow, mm -hmm. that's, that's, that's amazing, mm -hmm. that's amazing. Um, do you do any other types of treatments or are the prisms really? So the prisms are the crux of our treatment here, but we do do vision therapy as well. Mm -hmm. So with vision therapy, we work on specific skills. So we work on tracking, we work on saccadic eye movements, we work on making near far focusing changes, mm -hmm. we work on being able to converge your eyes or to diverge your eyes. So um, we're able to do specific activities which enable them to gain eye control better control. Got it. Mm -hmm. So sometimes lenses are not enough and we need to take that additional step too and then we use them in conjunction. So cool. Mm -hmm. How often would you say you need the, the vision therapy if I with the lenses? I would say 50% of the time. Okay. So 50% of the time lenses are enough and then 50 the rest we need to add some vision therapy in there too. Got it. Got it. Yeah. Now, a lot of people are, are probably going to be wondering, like, how in God's good earth do some of these kids end up with these issues? And I'm sure some of it we don't know. Right. So I often talk to my patients about if anything affects the brain, it affects the eyes. More than likely. It does, it's not always the case, mm -hmm. but it happens a good amount of the time. So if they have had a birth trauma and that has affected them, or if they've had a concussion or a fall. Um, maybe they skipped some of their developmental steps. Maybe they didn't mm. crawl. Um, then these things start to come into play. Like, I was just talking to a parent today about um, what happens when vision is beginning to be developed. And it actually starts when you're nursing the baby. Really? Huh. So when you're when a mom is nursing baby, um, 
baby is looking at mom and mom is looking at baby and fixation is developing one eye at a time. Wow, that's nuts. But if the pediatrician or the hospital, wherever the parent is getting care, does not say to moms who are not able to breastfeed or need to pump or need to use formula, to tell them that they needed to change arms every time they feed like they would Whoa. when they're breastfeeding because you wouldn't breastfeed just on one side. Yeah. They're only developing that visual system on the one side. No kidding. So although that communication is not often made, it's really an essential point and it's critical that babies crawl. It's, it's important that they hit their milestones sitting up, rolling over, crawling, and then walking. So when these steps are skipped, sometimes you can have the advent of visual issues. Hmm. Um, and there are issues with things going on within the baby or child themselves. So if there's a chromosomal deletion or there are other issues that impact motor, mm -hmm you will impact their visual system. Wow. And you had said also inflammation. So like Lyme, some of these chronic infections, uh, right. w which we're going to be talking about uh, as, as part of our segments, but even these can actually throw off. Absolutely. Lyme especially. But you can have that occur with Lyme or any autoimmune diseases or MS or wow. Parkinson's. They absolutely change the visual process. Wow. Mm -hmm. So you, you can have Lyme mold that throws off par parts of the brain through inflammation, the cranial nerves. Right. It creates that and then it just becomes a kind vicious. Of yeah. Wow. Mm -hmm. So again, you just want to tease it out. When you're dealing with a chronic illness, you're often so overwhelmed anyways with where to go and who to see, mm -hmm. but you do want to try to have that visual system assessed because it often can make the person so much more comfortable in yeah. their own body. Yeah, and just take them out of that spiral mm -hmm. of dysfunction. Right. And yeah, you know, that that's one of the things that I, I try to teach our families because there's so much to do. You know, you can do these crazy elimination diets, you mm -hmm. can go after pandas, you can do all of these things, but sometimes you need one thing to help start grounding the child. Mm -hmm. And like I, I'd say probably 10% of the kids that I see have horrible sleep apnea that have been missed. You know, so these kids are not breathing, they're choking while they're sleeping. And the mom is like, well, should we treat the diet? I'm like, no, we need to get this kid breathing mm -hmm. because they, they can't even be functional to, mm -hmm. to be able to do a diet. And I think it's the same case for this. If they can't see and they're just lost in space, mm -hmm. how can they function? And then through that like dysfunction, how can you talk about doing elimination diets or other mm -hmm. things? You need to treat some of the core imbalances first. Right. Uh, can you, uh, this is, uh, I think what you mentioned about birth traumas probably flew over the head of, of most of our audience. I mean, as an osteopath, and I've been blessed to work with a lot of really good osteopaths, so I'm, I'm attuned to this, but a lot of times we think of, you know, Pitocin and putting a vacuum on the kid and just yanking them out is not necessarily traumatic because it's just part of what we do, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and I mean, God bless the OBs, you know, for the, for the work they do to save the kid's life, you know, they just need to get the kid out. So it's not sure. a fault of the OB. They're just doing what they have to do for safety. Mm -hmm. But we don't think about like having a 180 pound person pulling on a 10 pound or eight pound little human being with all their force probably is causing some issues within mm -hmm. their skull and cranial nerves and all of that. Right, and you certainly can have visual changes following that. But when I do hear of that with my patients, I often recommend that they have osteopathic manipulative treatment in conjunction with my care because they have some underlying issues that are best served by also being treated. And so, you know, vision is a critical piece, but it's not the only game in town. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And so, um, Often the patients and the children are served when there's more of a team approach. Absolutely. And everyone can, to the best of their ability, serve that child. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that team approach is when the magic really happens, mm -hmm. right? Everyone comes in, they do their piece, and then all of a sudden you have this child transforming mm -hmm. seemingly overnight when the pieces have clicked. Yeah. 
uh, with these things, so uh, the the inflammation, can you help us kind of break it down to like the core piece? Is it that it causes the cranial nerves to be off and then that's what causes the visual disturbance? So how, how is it, uh, w whether it be birth trauma or chronic inf infection, inflammation, head trauma down the road, whatever, what, what does that do? Is it that the eyes are off, the cranial nerves aren't working, all of the above? Well, it isn't necessarily the cranial nerves per se, because when you think of cranial nerve changes as they affect the eye, you often think of strabismus. Mm -hmm. And so that doesn't mean you cannot have a strabismus that develops as a result of birth trauma, um, but it isn't the only change. So that's a possibility. Mm -hmm. More often than not, the change is that spatial mismatch again, mm -hmm. and it seems to be most easily affected by trauma and inflammation, this visual spatial mismatch. The acuity system is often unchanged. So it, you can, if you have 20-20 acuity and you know, tomorrow you have Lyme or another inflammatory condition, you probably still will have 20-20 acuity. But what tends to change is your ability to create visual spatial matches that make sense now. So it's almost the brain is in processing? The brain is in processing the information. Wow. So you still see it, you see it as clearly as you did prior, but it no longer makes sense. So hmm. you'll have, people who have had strokes, because there was a point in time where everything was, you know, quote unquote normal, and then they have a stroke, and then it's no longer normal, will say things like, well, the floor looks tilted, and mm. I see, but it's just not the same mm. anymore. And because they had a point in time where everything changed for them, they're often better at articulating what's going, what's on. going on. Whereas you have a child with a birth trauma, they don't know any different. No, it's been their experience forever. And so they are not going to necessarily tell you that the floor is tilted no. or that they don't feel comfortable when they're moving through space and that things don't seem to make sense. Yeah, no. So they just accommodate. They and just accommodate. And that's the, that's the, the cute part, but also sad part of children, mm -hmm. right? They, they just make do with what they have. They're still happy. They, they try to do the best. But I think it's really interesting that you bring this up because a lot of times I think we just come to say, well, this child is just, oh, Sally is just reserved, you know? Mm -hmm. she, Sally just doesn't like going and playing in the playground. She just likes to play on her own. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, Tommy is just the quiet guy that likes to play by himself in the corner. Mm -hmm. And for me, all of these are little clues that there's something probably happening in some sphere of processing that is causing them to just be off or overwhelmed when they go into these more chaotic environments. Right, and in those chaotic environments, there's movement and they have to figure out timing. Mm. And when they are trying to move through space and there's balls in play and there's jump ropes and there's swings, that is so overwhelming to a child that can't figure out where they are in relationship. So it's better to mm. pull back and to just play more quietly when they don't have to try to figure out how to navigate through the situation. Makes me sad. Yeah. I'm sure that's why you do what you do. Mm -hmm. And that, that's why I'm creating this system, because I, I feel like people need to know this. You know, a lot of times people have no clue that this is of any significance. Correct. And, you know, it, it's, it's to me the little pieces that are ultimately the most critical, mm -hmm. right? If, if the child is showing up as anxiety or they've got the learning, whatever they're labeled as, but you miss the little piece, and that little piece then causes another thing, which then causes another thing, and it's usually a cascade. You know, they, they start off with one error, that creates another scenario. Next thing you know, because they're in a chronic stress response all their time, the gut is affected, the gut causes inflammation, which then causes something else, and you get this mess. Mm -hmm. But th these are all the little pieces that uh, I think people need to hear about, and I'm so grateful for you to share Share it, for you to be sharing your wisdom. Yes. Uh, other things that you think the audience needs to be aware of? Other, I mean, we covered a lot. We have, and I, I think we've covered most. Um, I would just, you know, say again that I think that coupling the vision piece with other treatments uh, tends to be the most successful, unless it is just specifically a visual issue. 
So I would encourage uh, parents to assemble their best team for their child. And that, that's part of what I hope to be able to give them the guidance so they can do that wherever they are. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very nice. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you.